Hey, everybody, John here, and welcome back to the Geek Corner. Yes, this is the show that I actually canceled. But I have heard from some of you that due to a review that I did on the Geek Corner two years ago, uh, I believe it was released April 10th, 2016, on the book Ready Player One, that many of you were excited about the film and wanted to know my thoughts on the movie. Did the movie match up to the book? Did they do a good job with it? So I'm bringing back the Geek Corner for this special engagement. I might do it every now and then if there's some particular movie that I want to review or something like that. But uh, this one is really for you, uh, those of you out there that asked for me to talk about this film in particular. So here we go, starting with the uh, synopsis at IMDb. When the creator of a virtual reality world called the Oasis dies, he releases a video in which he challenges all Oasis users to find his Easter egg which will give the finder his fortune. Now, I did just rewatch my previous review. Um, I'm happy that I did because for some reason, me thinking back on the book, uh, I seem to recall enjoying it a bit more than my review actually <laughs> led me to believe. <laughs> Interestingly, I still think it's a very fun read, um, but it is a story that has a couple of problems with the narrative and those still stick out in the film. One of the biggest complaints that I had from the book that certainly did not get addressed in the movie is our hero, uh, Parzival, doesn't develop. He is pretty much the same person at the start of the movie as he is at the end of the movie. Now, I have to say, when I first started watching the movie, I was really excited because the early scenes seem to reflect what I remember from the book very, very well. Uh, but then there was a first little hiccup where um, there's one scene in the book that I recall, and this really isn't a major spoiler, but at the there's a funeral that happens at the start of this movie. And in the funeral, it explains all the people that are sitting in the audience. And it talks about characters from 80s movies sitting in the audience. Uh, I can't remember the particulars, but like the breakfast club would be sitting in the audience of this funeral. Uh, in the film, they don't show the audience at all, which I think kind of, you know, um, takes care of a big problem for them. One of the big problems that I was concerned about when I heard that they were making this into a film, which was licensing, trying to get licensing rights for all of those images, all of those actors likenesses, uh, the intellectual property from the different studios. I knew that that was going to be a major challenge here. It does affect the film um, is it necessarily a bad thing? I don't really know. I didn't, I didn't feel like it was necessarily a bad thing when I was watching the film. Uh, it was just different. But the style of it, the style of mashing up all these wonderful 80s properties, um, but that there's another difference to kind of make between the book and the film. The book was very 80s centric. The film, not so much. It has some 80s, some 90s. It kind of goes all the way to current. You'll even see one of my favorite characters, uh, the Master Chief, running through uh, from Halo in one of the battle scenes. So I think they they did that intentionally. They were trying to open it up to different aged audiences because like I mentioned in my review of the book, it felt extremely 80s centric. For someone that was born and raised in that time frame, super, super enjoyable. Uh, maybe for people that were born and raised through the 90s, they still would have gotten a lot of the references. But uh, as we're talking to younger, younger generations, they probably would have started missing more and more of those references. So um, ultimately, the style of the film feels like the style of the book. Um, there's some things that they kind of toned down in the film that I don't think really helped it. If I recall correctly, um, Parzival, our hero, or his name is Wade, lives with his aunt and his aunt's boyfriend, who's a real nasty guy. And if I recall correctly, in the book, they really played that up. This was someone that was, you know, literally like domestic violence type nasty. And in the film, that is completely played down. He's just kind of a jerk to Wade. Um, Unfortunately, by playing that stuff down, even the environment that they live in, it's called the stacks and it's basically mobile homes, but because uh, you know there's overpopulation, they're having to stack the mobile homes on top of each other, almost like a, a, a kind of like a low budget high rise. Um, 
that looks visually exactly how I imagined it. And the cover for the book actually shows a picture of that. So they, they pretty much went with that artist's interpretation for the film. But it didn't really give you a good sense of why people were so eager to escape reality. So especially you're, you're detuning this major dramatic point of this, um, of Wade having to live with an abuser. You're kind of not showing the, um, how truly bad it is to be living in this situation called the stacks. And then you're seeing other parts of the real world where it's like, well, yeah, it doesn't seem like it's so bad, uh, you know, where Samantha lives and some other stuff. So uh, there's there's kind of a big question that I felt was handled better in the book that isn't really handled very well in the movie, and that is, why is it so attractive for people to escape into the Oasis? Another major, major difference, and I don't know that you could really necessarily blame the author for this. This might have been more about my interpretation, but when I was reading the book, if you would uh, be reading about a scene where uh, Parzival was going into a movie, which happens in the book, kind of happens once in the movie Ready Player One, but not in the same way that it happened in the books. But I know that that sounds a bit convoluted. Um, I always imagined that the environments in the Oasis looked like real life. That's one of the things that I was most excited about when I heard that they were making a film, because especially if they were going to get some 80s properties, like wouldn't it be great to see uh, you know, Matthew Broderick from War Games popping up in a scene and knowing that they had to do some rad CGI to uh, you know, make another actor look like him or something like that. I was kind of expecting that level of trick. Uh, almost like bringing, um, oh, what's his name? Moff Tarkin. Hope I'm saying that right. I know I'm, I'm, I'm a bigger Star Wars fan than that, I swear. Um, but bringing him back for Rogue One, where you literally have a different actor having an older actor's face painted digitally on them. I was hoping for that level of special effects. And you really don't get that. Basically, when they're in the Oasis, it just looks like a video game, which I'm okay with, except for the fact that they're setting this in the future, and the way that this video games this video game looks is extremely present. <laughs> it looks like a modern video game from right now. It does not look like a video game from the future. It doesn't look like reality, which is ultimately one of the big promises of virtual reality, is at some point that it's going to be able to be so good and especially for this story to work, it has to be so good that it takes you away from uh, wanting to be in the real world. And just the way this film looks, it didn't really nail that for me. Uh, and I felt a little bit cheated. There's one scene in particular where all of a sudden um, it does look like the real world. And I don't know why they would have that just for that one scene, but they wouldn't have it for everything else. Why would everything else look like uh, kind of this you know, CGI cut scene from a, from a current video game? Um, there are tons of things to be seen in this. Uh, a lot of your favorite characters from all kinds of stuff from film, uh, comic books, uh, definitely a lot of video game uh, characters that pop up in this as well. Uh, some vehicles, of course, the DeLorean from Back to the Future that all of us true geeks love is in this. Um, I've also got something special for you guys on Johnny Vlogs. I'm going to talk about that more at the end of this video, but it includes footage of a real life version of this new twist on the DeLorean, or uh, I guess we can call it Parzival's DeLorean. Um, so all that stuff is really fun to see, um, but because it's in this kind of cartoony environment, it just takes a little bit away. And it just, I, I was really hoping that they were going to try to make all that stuff as real world or almost hyper realistic as possible. But you have to have a baseline of realistic. And for me, the visuals on this film just didn't quite do that. I still enjoyed the heck out of it. Don't get me wrong. It was a very easy pill to swallow. <laughs> and ultimately, doing it in that kind of 3D generated video game universe gave them a lot of flexibility with being able to bring in other characters. It's just the excitement factor for me in terms of seeing those other characters like, you know, Freddy Krueger or Jason or Chucky uh, goes down a little bit when it's an obvious 3D model as opposed to 
looking like uh, a photograph, you know, of, oh, wow, did they actually get Robert England to do that? Or did they digitally paint some other actor? I mean, for Steven Spielberg, you know, realizing this is a guy that brought us photorealistic dinosaurs, I was a little let down at that aspect. And obviously I was because I keep harping on this same point. So I'm going to try to move forward from here. Um, the story is fun. It's light. It doesn't take itself extremely seriously, which I think actually works against it a little bit, uh, as opposed to the book, which does take itself a bit more seriously. There are some aspects missing, like uh, in the book, I seem to recall a lot about them going to school, and that school is actually the reason why they even have their headsets and their gloves. None of that is brought up in this version. Uh, it's like they don't have school at all, like everyone just goes into this video game environment to hang out. Um, some of the explanation of the plot planets and how they get from planet to planet in the book was really, really cool. And in the movie, it's just almost, it's almost covered up. It's kind of there, like you'll hear that they're on a different planet. Uh, in one case, you do see a ship, uh, the Serenity, um, flying, and you kind of know that someone must have traveled from another planet, but it's not laid out anywhere as near detailed as the book in terms of understanding how the planets are. Uh, you literally have planets that are themed after certain movies or certain properties in the book, and you don't quite get that same level of understanding about how the Oasis is, is structured uh, in the film. But I have to say, sitting there watching it, I felt like a little kid again. And that was a really awesome feeling. Uh, it's been a while for me since I've really enjoyed a Steven Spielberg film like this. I'm not a big fan of what I consider his adult films. No, not adult film like that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the movies that he's obviously making for older audiences. What was, I think The Post is a recent one. Uh, Lincoln, it's just, it's, it's. I, I don't want to go to a Spielberg movie to see something like that. I expect more of an Indiana Jones, of a Jurassic Park. And even with Jurassic Park, I, I had my challenges with it. But I feel like we haven't had a good Spielberg spectacle film in a long time that was just kind of a family-friendly, fun thing. And this definitely nailed that for me. It made me feel uh, nostalgic and young again, and all those wonderful things that movies can do. Uh, on top of all that, I just want to give a really quick shout out to uh, 4DX, which is only available in like six regal cinemas in the country. Uh, luckily, I was in Washington, D.C. over this past weekend. Hint, hint, that might have something to do with what we're going to talk about on Johnny Vlogs next week. Um, and they had one there, a 4DX theater. Uh, essentially, it is like watching your favorite movie and being in a, an amusement park ride at the same time. Uh, you're in a seat, the seat has full motion, tilts forward, tilts back, tilts left, tilts right. Uh, there's fog effects, there's lighting effects, there's wind effects. Uh, when it's raining on the screen, it's raining on your head. Um, it worked really, really well for this movie in particular. If you live anywhere near one of these 4DX theaters, I'm telling you, you have to see this movie in that environment. It is amazing. It's just having this story being told about virtual reality and then sitting in a theater where you have all these kind of, uh, you know, I don't even know what you call it, reality augmentation type things happening in the theater was super, super cool. Um, it wasn't great in just a few aspects. Uh, one of them, it was occasionally when something would blow up on screen or if there was a light that was flashing or something like that, they would have lights in the actual theater that are flashing. But all of a sudden, then you're looking at the theater walls <laughs> as the lights are flashing and it kind of takes you out of the film just a little bit because you're like, well, why are you lighting this up out here and showing me the theater? Uh, and especially because the light didn't match the color of the light that was on screen. They were just white lights that would kind of kick on and off. Uh, really, really small knock. The other thing was the seats also had, I guess you would call them pokers, um, built into the back of the seat that would kind of stick you uh, in your ribs for certain scenes. And the times they would use them were kind of weird. Like if you saw a character on screen that got um, stabbed with a sword, all of a sudden you'd feel this poker, you know, jab into your back, like a finger just going right into your back. 
it's weird because you're watching this scene happen on the screen over there and you're seeing someone else get poked, but then all of a sudden it's happening to you. So it's not really a great use. There's this weird thing that happens in your, in your brain where you think like something else is happening to you. You're not really associating it with what's happening on the screen. And then in one scene in particular, I don't know why, uh, one of the pokers poked me uh, and then got stuck there for like five minutes. And I even asked my wife, I was like, did your poker like stick you in the back for like five minutes in the middle of that movie? She's like, yeah, I don't know if it must have just been in their programming um, that they forgot to retract it or something. But it was really uncomfortable because all of a sudden you're trying to lean back in your seat and you got this one finger poking you on one side <laughs> in your ribs. Uh, wasn't particularly great. And just the whole poker thing in general I don't know that I like it being poked in the ribs. You know, you're already moving me around. You're blowing smoke in my face. You're dropping water on my head when it's raining. I've got enough going on with this 4DX experience that I don't need to be poked on top of it. Um, I'm pretty sure that I annoyed some of my fellow classmates when I was in school by doing that exact same thing, poking them in the ribs when I was sitting behind them. So, um, yeah, outside of that, though, excellent experience. I highly recommend it. Uh, check out Regal Cinema. See if you have a 4DX theater by you. And if you do, this is the perfect movie for it. It is not cheap. Most expensive movie tickets I've ever bought in my life. Uh, 26 bucks each for that experience. But it is a true experience. It takes a movie to the next level. This is the perfect movie for doing that. So ultimately on IMDb right now... Um, Ready Player One is rating an 8 out of 10, and that's with 51,000 votes. Uh, I believe it came in first place this past weekend, is doing pretty well. Um, I could tell you guys I would easily go and see it again already, and I just saw it a couple days ago. Uh, very enjoyable, a lot of fun to be had here. I want to go see it again because I know there's a bunch of characters that I missed in the background. I want to just take it all in again, see if I could find more of them. Uh, for a movie that is ultimately about finding an Easter egg, it's fun that part of the enjoyment of watching the movie is literally finding Easter eggs. Uh, great performances, um, really well directed, well put together, some really good special effects, very fun and intense battle scenes that happen around this. A uh, little bit of a lesson at the end that once again kind of called back to the 80s in a strange way. Like, do you remember when TV shows always had to give you this kind of neatly wrapped up lesson at the by the end of the episode? Uh, it hits on that here as well. Um, Ultimately, what do I like better between the book and the movie? I think I would say I like the book a bit better, but it's a bigger time commitment. Um, it just, it wraps you up in the environment a lot more. It explains a lot more of the nuance of how the technology works to you. It gets you into things a bit deeper than the film does, but the film is a really good representation. Um, I would love if they could actually open this universe up and maybe have sequels to this. Uh, when I first read the book and I was first thinking about the movie, I kind of felt like it was a one-shot deal, like you couldn't really do a sequel with it. But after spending some time um, really rethinking about the movie and the messages and the things that they were trying to address, uh, I do think that they have some opportunity to expand the story and to answer some questions and to go into some of the questions a bit deeper than they did in this one. There's a lot of questions here in terms of virtual reality that they just kind of lightly touch on. Uh, I think it's a much deeper topic that could be explored with a Ready Player Two or a Ready Player One Part Two or whatever they would call it. I'm not sure. Have you guys seen it yet? Let's talk about it in the comments below. Were you lucky enough to see it in a 4DX theater or have you seen anything in a 4DX theater before? Let me know what you think about those pokers. <laughs> I'm really curious if that was just me or not. Uh, thank you so much for hanging out on this resurrected episode of the Geek Corner. Hope you guys enjoyed a little change of pace. Um, Johnny Vlogs on Monday, we're going to be talking again about a geeky kind of topic. Washington, D.C. last weekend might have to do with where I got this new hat. And I know many of you, when I did the studio tour, were wondering what my wife looks like. Well, I might answer that question on Monday's Johnny Vlogs. And if you remember the studio tour, there was a particular TV show 
Does that have something to do with where I was this past weekend? Be sure to check it out on Monday, get all those questions answered. I'll see you there. But come back tomorrow for a brand new Brain Scratch, part two on the Lindsay Buziak case. We are going to be interviewing her father, Jeffrey. So I hope you won't miss that. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you next time here on the Lord Arts channel. <laughs>